It is interesting that Professor Schmidt acknowledges that the red line of where a cyber operation constitutes a violation of Article 2.4 was not decisively solved in the Tallinn Manual. This is a matter of ongoing state practice to reveal more concretely, though the manual does outline factors that may be taken into account when coming to this determination. A more fundamental question is when does a cyber operation amount to an armed attack for the purposes of, of invoking a right of self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter? Again, the Nicaragua case is instructive in this area in that it holds that such an armed attack must be of sufficient gravity. Equally, it must be borne in mind that a cyber operation that constitutes a violation of Article 2.4 on the threat or use of force may not actually rise to the level of an armed attack, giving rise to a right to respond in self-defence through either cyber means or through kinetic force. Let's listen to how the Tallinn Manual applies these factors in the context of cyber operations. 2.4 is only about whether or not a state has violated international law with its cyber operation. The response comes in Article 51. When can I respond? You can respond when the use of force directed against you is of a particular, particularly egregious use of force known as an armed attack. The, we believed uh, that is not the position of the United States, but all the experts concurred that we believe these are two different standards. That the charter was meant to allow people to trip over the use of force pretty easily but that before a state could resort to force in response, it had to be a pretty bad use of force. So here we were much more comfortable saying the threshold is uh, armed attack, I'm sorry, is physical destruction injury. And significant, not the physical destruction of my uh, laptop, but rather significant physical damage or injury. It's at that point that the right of self-defense matures. Now we were very quick, and I happen to be one of these people who said, that we believe this norm will evolve. And it's because international law is meant to track the values of a society. And so if suddenly we see particular aspects of a society's um, activities subject to new threats, we can expect the interpretation of existing law to, through state practice, move very, very quickly to meet this new threat. We saw this example with respect to transnational terrorism. I, I could go on and on about that, but I expect to see the same thing in cyber. So, for example, I've just explained that uh, you probably need physical damage. What if someone conducted a massive cyber attack against the Australian economy, which could be done, and you are starting to collapse aspects of the Australian economy? That's not physically destructive, may manifest in physical consequences such as hunger down the road, but it's not physically destructive. Nevertheless, I'm not quite certain that the Australian government would not resort to force, either, either cyber force or kinetic force, in order to respond to something that devastating. So we will see that norm evolve pretty quickly, and we're starting to see some movement on the part of states, particularly the Dutch, in this direction.